Okay, guys, welcome. Today we're going to talk about statistical inference. So what do we mean by statistical inference? It's, well, when we find that the difference between what is observed and what is expected uh, is too, too big to be explained by just chance or by coincidence alone, uh, we say that the difference is statistically significant, right? So we're essentially going to get into, when we say statistical inference, we're essentially going to get into using uh, statistics to say that something happened uh, because of something, right? So for example, uh, we want to determine, are the events statistically significant? Now, in part A, we have that the MLB team with the worst win-loss record defeats the team with the best record. And of course, this is not significant. Right, because this is something that happens more frequently than you would think, it's not, it's not significant because uh, there's a lot of factors that contribute to this. So lots of factors that contribute to this. Right, just because the team with the worst win-loss record defeats the team with the best record doesn't mean that they're better. Maybe they were just better that night, right? Maybe the team with the best record uh, didn't take this other team seriously and things like that. Now, part B, we have in terms of the global average temperature, the 12 years from 2001 to 2012 were 12 of the 14 hottest years on record since 1880. And of course, this is significant Because if it was based on chance alone, we would expect everything to be spread out more among those years between 1880 and 2012, right? Because we have uh, most of the years are clustered. To 2001 to 2012. Right, so the idea of statistical inference is showing things like this by using statistics. Now in the next example, we have that a researcher conducts a double blind experiment that tests whether a new herbal formula is effective in preventing colds. So during a three month period, the 100 randomly selected people in a treatment group take the herbal formula, while the 100 randomly selected people in the control group take a placebo. Now the results show that 30 people in the treatment group get colds um, compared to 32 people in the control group? Can we conclude that the herbal formula is effective in preventing colds? And of course the answer here is no, because you know there's a bunch of different factors going on. And not only that, but the treatment group was only better by two cases. Right. So the question is, are those two cases significant enough to compare the fact that you had some kind of uh, effectiveness in this herbal formula? And the answer, of course, is no. Right. So the two additional colds is not enough. To say that this was significant. Right, so that's sort of what we mean by the idea of statistically significant. Now, ways that we can quantify statistical significance are as follows. If the probability of an observed difference occurring by chance is 1 in 20, which would be 5% uh, or less, then we say the difference is statistically significant at the 0 0.05 level. Now, if the probability of an observed, of an observed difference occurring by chance is 1 in 100, or 1% or less, we say that the difference is statistically significant at the 0 0.01 level. So the lower you can get that statistically significant level to be, the more powerful of a statement that you have. Okay. Now in example three, we have that in 1954, a large experiment was conducted to test the effectiveness of a new vaccine for polio created by Dr. Jonas Salk. 
A sample of 400,000 children were chosen from the population of all children in the United States. Now, half of these uh, children received an injection of the Salk vaccine. The other half received an, injective, uh, an injection of placebo containing only salt water. Now, among the children receiving the Salk vaccine, only 33 contracted polio compared to 115 polio cases among the children who did not get the Salk vaccine. Now, calculations show that the probability of this difference between the groups occurring by chance is less than 0.01. Describe the implications of this result. Well, this means essentially that 99% chance this vaccine was, ex was effective. was the reason in the lower cases. Right, because it occurring by chance is less than 1%, right, or less than 0 0.01. So that means that sort of on the other hand that it not occurring by chance, right, it being a result of this vaccine would be 99%. Now next we can talk about the margin of error and confidence intervals. Now suppose you draw a single sample of size n from a large population and measure its sample proportion. Now we say that the margin of error for 95% confidence is one over the square root of n. Now you can find the confidence interval by subtracting and adding the margin of error from the sample uh, proportion. We did this in a previous video. Um, now, with that being said, you can be 95% confident that the true population proportion lies within this interval. And of course, the margin of error would decrease as the sample size increases. The more of a uh, large sample you have, the less uh, you introduce things like chance. Now, in example four, we want to find the margin of error and the 95% confidence interval for the following survey. So in part A, we have a survey of 500 people finds that 52% plan to vote for Smith for governor. Well, first, to find the margin of error, I need to do one over the square root of n, right? Because that's given by this formula here. So in this case, my n is 500. So if I do one divided by square root 500, we're going to get that the margin of error is 0 0.0447. So that means that our margin of error is 4.47%, right? Now the confidence interval, would be from our given percentage, so 52% minus 4.47% to 52 plus 4.47%. So if I take 52 and I subtract 4.47, I'm going to get a, let's see, so 52 minus 4.47 would give me a 47.53. If I add them, I'm going to get a 56.47. So my confidence interval is between 47.53% to 56.47%. Now in part B, we have a survey of 1,500 people finds that 87% support stricter penalties for child abuse. So here, our margin of error would be one over square root of 1,500. So one over square root of 1,500 would give me a 0 0.0258, and then we'll say two, because it's close enough to that. So then we're gonna get a 2.582%. Okay, so now for the confidence interval, I'm 
I need to go from, so my true percentage or the percentage that was purported, I should say, is 87 minus 2.582% to 87 plus 2.582%. Right, so if I do 87 minus 2.582%, I'm gonna get 2.582, that this is an 84.418%. And then if I add them, I'm gonna get an 89.582. And again, just to be clear, what do we mean by this confidence interval? We mean that we're 95% sure that the true value is between this in between these two numbers, All right? So that's the idea of what we mean by a confidence interval. And of course, same thing for this. Okay, now suppose the Bureau of Labor Statistics finds that 3,420 unemployed people in a sample of 60,000 people um, and we wanna estimate the population employment rate and give a 95% confidence interval. So we're doing the same calculation. So the margin of error is one over 60,000 square root, I should say. And if we do one over square root of 60,000, We're going to get that this is a 0 0.004082, which is a 0.4082%. Now you have to be careful here because what's the true or what's the reported unemployment? We're not given that directly. We have to calculate that. So that's 3420 unemployed out of a total of 60,000. So if we calculate that, we're going to get that this is a 0 0.057, which is a 5.7%. So then that means that the 95% confidence interval for this So confidence interval would be 5.7 minus 0.4082% to 5.7 plus 4.082, 0 0.4082%, sorry. Okay, so if we subtract and add these, if I do 5.7 minus 0.4082, I'm going to get a 5.2918%. And then if I add, I'm going to get a 6.1082%. All right, so we can be 95% sure that the actual unemployment rate will be between those two numbers, those two percentages. Okay, now in the remainder of the section, we're gonna talk about hypothesis testing, right? Now, there's two hypotheses that we make. Now, the null hypothesis claims a specific value for a population parameter, right? So it's often the value expected in the case of no special effect. And of course, the null hypothesis is that we're claiming that it's equal to something, right? And then the alternative hypothesis is the claim that's accepted if the null hypothesis is rejected, right? So essentially the opposite of the null hypothesis. All right, and I think this is just a duplicate slide. Yeah, that's what it looks like, okay. So in example six, we have that a dog food company claims that its special diet mix will allow Labrador retrievers to live to a mean age of 15 years, All right? Now a consumer group says that this claim is overstated and that the actual average is less than the company's claim. So state the null and hi alternative hypothesis for a hypothesis test. Well, the null hypothesis is the one that claims sp specific value. So 
So what's the one claiming this specific value? It's that they live to a mean of 15 years. Okay, and of course the alternative hypothesis is the one that rejects that. So the one that would reject is that the mean would be less than 15 years. So that's the alternative hypothesis. Okay. Now, what are the possible outcomes of a hypothesis test? All right. Now you have to be very careful about how we are wording this because there's only two possibilities. You either reject the null hypothesis, in which case we have evidence in support of the alternative hypothesis, or we do not reject the null hypothesis. And that's where you have the opposite. You don't have enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. There's no such thing as accepting the null hypothesis, right? Because we're almost assuming that the null hypothesis is true. It's only we reject the null hypothesis or we don't reject it. Okay, now in this next example, we have that the two possible outcomes of a hypothesis test concern the following. Now, a company once claimed that its product could increase a woman's chances of giving birth to a baby girl. Assume that the normal chance of giving birth to a baby girl is 50%. So in this case, the null hypothesis is this. Right, because it's claiming a specific value, and that's that the chance of giving birth to a girl is 50%. And of course, the alternative hypothesis would be the chance of a girl is more than 50%. And, that, and those would be your two different hypotheses. Now the outcomes would be either that you reject the null hypothesis and that would be the case where you have evidence that companies claim is correct that their product would increase the woman's chances of giving birth to a girl or you would fail to reject, or you would not reject the null hypothesis. And this is where you do not have evidence that the company's product is true. Or I should say works, not is true. Right, and those are the only two possible outcomes that we can have. And that's the idea behind the two different possible outcomes. Okay, now as far as hypothesis test decisions go, we decide the outcome of a hypothesis test by comparing the actual sample result, which is the mean or the proportion to the result expected if the null hypothesis is true. Now, if the chance of a sample result at least as extreme as the observed result is less than one in 100 or 0 0.01, we say it's significant at the 0 0.01 level. And this would offer strong evidence for rejecting the null hypothesis. And of course, of accepting the, alter the alternative hypothesis. Now, if the chance of a sample result is at least extreme as the observed result is less than one in 20 or 0 0.05, then it's significant at the 0 0.05 level. And that would offer moderate evidence for rejecting the null hypothesis. So not as strong as 0 0.01, but it would give you moderate evidence. Now, if the chance of a sample result at least as extreme as, observe, as the observed result is greater than one in 20, then the test is not significant. And that would not give you enough uh, grounds to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. 
So finally, I think this is the last example, yeah. So in example eight, we have a county health official believes that the mean birth weight of male babies at a local hospital is greater than the national average of 3.39 kilograms. All right, so let's first write that down because that's going to be our alternative and null hypothesis. So it looks like the null hypothesis is the one where we claim a specific value. So that's going to be uh, average baby male is 3.39 kilograms, right? Now the alternative is that it's greater than this. Average baby male is greater than 3.39 kilograms. Now a random sample of 145 male babies born at that hospital has a mean birth weight of 3.61 kilograms. Now, assuming that the mean birth weight of all male babies born in a hospital is an average average of 3.39 kilograms, a calculation shows that the probability of selecting a sample with a mean birth weight of at least 3.61 kilograms is 0 0.032. At least. 3.61 kilograms, All right? So we have our null and alternative hypothesis and the sample that we collected provides a 0 0.032. So this would provide not a 0 0.01 level, but it does provide a 0 0.05 since it's less than that level of significance. So since we have a 0 0.05 level of significance, we have moderate evidence to reject the null hypothesis. All right, and that's sort of the idea here. Okay, well that concludes this video on statistical inference. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you next time.